delighted to be here. I can't tell you how encouraging uh, this time has been. I have become uh, a bit of a grumpy old man on <laughs> this subject, and uh, I just feel like the Lord gave me a wonderful opportunity to see marvelous signs of hope. I've, been, uh, I've learned, I've been inspired, and I come away with a real sense of hope for what the Lord is doing in this very important area. Back in 1980, I published a book called Called to Holy Worldliness, uh, where I argued for a lot of these things in kind of a, a, a primal form, uh, not nearly as uh, detailed and nuanced and sophisticated as we've uh, been hearing here at this gathering. A couple of my students, uh, PhD students a couple years ago, went through the book and they encouraged me to revise it. And so I read it again. I hadn't read it for a long time. And I, I realized that uh, it was unrevisable, uh, <laughs> partly because uh, people here have done such marvelous new work, went well beyond some of the things that I said. But even more, I, I kind of was anti-clerical uh, in the thing. I, I was kind of anti church in the whole thing. And I'd been shaped in that by a group that sort of adopted me. They were mainly World Council type people and Roman Catholics. The World Council people have been very much influenced by Hendrik Kramer's uh, a wonderful book published in 1964, uh, Theology of the Laity, which is really a classic in this whole area. And a number, incidentally, of World Council people uh, right around the post-World War II period had done some terrific stuff in this area. You get Hans Rudy Weber, a wonderful book called uh, God's Salty People and the like. So there really is a, a literature and some Catholics who had been very much influenced by uh, Pope Leo's 1891 uh, encyclical called Rerum Novarum, which was a, really a, a groundbreaking uh, theology of work, uh, m much uh, more sophisticated stuff came out of uh, Vatican II and the discussions of the apostolate of the laity. But I got drawn into that group. Uh, there was another guy named Mark Gibbs who became a very close friend uh, who uh, had written, co-authored a book in, uh, in 1964 entitled, uh, I'm sorry, in, in, yeah, in 1964, entitled God's Frozen People, where he argued, and he was very much against the ways in which seminaries and churches really uh, inhibited the ministry of lay people beyond the boundaries of the church. And I picked up a, a lot of that. And, uh, but I was very active uh, in the evangelical world, and I felt very lonely at the time. I incidentally had one good friend, Pete Hammond of InterVarsity, who got into this stuff very early and his name needs to be lifted up in, in our circles. Uh, but I saw lots of ways in which God's people were not being encouraged to see their work beyond the boundaries of the church as being sent forth by God uh, into uh, the, 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 the life of the world. And, uh, and I, I got very discouraged uh, about all this, and I often felt very lonely. And uh, I was teaching at Calvin College at the time, and then I was invited to uh, move to the faculty at Fuller Theological Seminary in 1985. And I've got to say, my friends, people like Mark Gibbs and others, were angry with me for going to a seminary. Because they said, nothing good is happening in the seminaries. And at Calvin College, you have this opportunity to be teaching people who are going into the insurance business and into law and to the area of the arts and, and other areas of, of ministry beyond. And you have this good Kuyperian theology that encourages that kind of thing. But they're not teaching that kind of thing in seminaries. Why in the world would you want to go? And then I, I became president. And he even got angrier with me on that. And the last time I saw him, he was dying of cancer. And... And, and the very last thing he said to me, 
maybe this could work, but you've got to be faithful. And I have tried to be faithful, but I, I really don't feel that uh, I accomplish much in terms of, we have the wonderful Dupree Center, and Max Dupree, and I've learned so much from many lay people. Uh, Bob Lane, the uh, CEO, uh, now retired of uh, John Deere, uh, had read my book on common grace. He had three books that had influenced him as the CEO of John Deere. Uh, one was Arthur Holmes's book, All Truth is God's Truth. And uh, he said, you know, I'm working with Hindus, I'm working with Muslims, I'm working with Sikhs, I'm working with uh, people around the world. And not only do I get to work with them, but I can actually learn from them because God, all truth is God's truth. And he loved John Stott, and then he liked some of the Dutch Calvinist stuff on, uh, on Abraham Kuyper and, and uh, you know, Christ is Lord of the whole creation and the like. Um, but it was a lonely time in, in many ways. And I'm going to say I have really gotten some signs of hope here in the last uh, two days. And I want to thank you. It's been a powerful experience for me. But I want to say this. We've got a lot of work to do. And, and wonderful things are happening in the seminaries. I mean, you, you, there, there's just such really good stuff happening. But there has to be a lot more that happens. And... Uh, and, and it's not going to be easy. We, we have our work cut out for us. You know, the Lilly Endowment in 1980, uh, uh, 1999 uh, began giving uh, grants of up to $2 million each to 88 church-related colleges, many of them evangelical schools, to study vocation. And that's an ongoing thing. Uh, Ten years later, 2009, they expanded that also to give grants of up to uh, um, 100,000 uh, at a time to uh, 101 campus ministries. And so they've been giving them to, to undergraduate programs in vocational formation to the degree that and I've gone through the numbers with Lily people just in the last uh, week or so, uh, at the minimum, they've invested $150 million in the la since 1999 in helping undergraduates at church-related colleges to think of their work <coughs> as, as vocation, as a calling from God. Yeah. Nothing like that has been invested in theological education. And here's, to me, the troubling question. When these students actually graduate and go out into the workforce, what kind of churches are they going to go back to? <laughs> uh, are they going to go to churches that will encourage what they have learned in these vocational programs in their lives as, uh, as college and university undergraduates? And I think we need to think about that. And of course, I've had the assignment, so I've been thinking about it even more as I've listened to things going on uh, here in these wonderful talks. Uh, what do seminaries need to be like to equip the churches, to equip God's people to serve God in the patterns of their work and their play beyond the boundaries of the church, the, that world that they're being sent into. What do we need to be doing in theological education? And I want to say, I think there are some serious obstacles uh, to doing what we need to do. Uh, we, many of you are overcoming these obstacles, but they're still pretty prominent. Uh, let me just mention three that uh, are, are very much on my mind. One is a kind of ecclesiocentrism where people are, are, are encouraged to get involved in church. Uh, I was in the philosophy department at Calvin College when I was working on all this stuff. And uh, we belong to the same congregation, Christian Reformed congregation, as uh, Alvin Plantinga and his family. And many of you know Alvin Plantinga was a marvelous philosopher. And uh, uh, we had a lot of uh, good discussions in our philosophy department about how we were serving the kingdom and the like. 
And Al got an invitation to, uh, this was before he moved to Notre Dame, but he got an invitation to teach a couple of courses at Notre Dame during a year. So he's going to have to uh, commute from Grand Rapids to South Bend. And it was going to be a time-consuming thing. Well, his pastor came to him and asked him to serve as elder. Would he allow his name to stand to be elected elder? And Al said, no, I really got to, you know, I can't because I've just agreed to uh, teach some courses at Notre Dame. And then the pastor, who really was very good in so many ways, but the pastor said to him, well, one of these days you're going to have to decide to do something for the kingdom. <laughs> and that's that kind of thinking. I was in uh, South Korea talking to a bunch of uh, uh, Fuller alums. And uh, one of our Korean alums went back, got an MD, went back to Korea, took a job as a, a religion reporter in a newspaper where every week he, re he reached several million readers. And he told me that his fellow pastors were angry with him because he did not go into ministry. Yeah. And, uh, and, and he said to me, and it was a kind of an illuminating thing for me, he said, Fuller Seminary is a big part of the problem in South Korea. Because you teach this church growth stuff that encourages pastors to have big congregations and to spend a lot of money on programs. And they have very wealthy people. But what they want from them is to go out and make money in that horrible world out there and then bring the money into the church so that the church can do things. And he said, there's nothing happening for the formation of people serving in the Korean parliament, nothing happening in the business world, in the entertainment world, the growing film industry. And he said, Fuller has been a part of the problem in South Korea, and it's about time they start becoming a part of the solution. But these are very common patterns. And that is, we want them to be involved in our programs, in our church. And that's what it means to serve the Lord, to finally do something for the kingdom. And that still is much too prominent today. So that kind of ecclesial centrism. Secondly, and I'm going to want to nuance what I'm saying here, but guild-directed or guild-guided patterns of theological education. And that is... Uh, we take our direction on what to, what's to teach in seminaries from the academic guilds. Now, I want immediately to say, we, in the evangelical world, uh, it's just been wonderful that we have entered into the guilds. And the kind of scholarship that we've produced in the last half century or so has been just terrific. And I've seen that happen in my lifetime, and it's wonderful. And uh, I don't mean to see us abandon the guilds, but we also need to have a focus on the kinds of theological questions that are important for the life of God's people. This morning I was telling some folk that Arthur Holmes at Wheaton College uh, made a distinction in one of his books between two kinds of theology. One is professional theology. And that's the, uh, the kinds of discussions that theologians have as they argue with other theologians. And that's really good. You know, doctrine of the Trinity, doctrine of the atonement, questions about the nature of, and person of Christ, uh, the two natures and all of that, very technical questions, and we need that. But he said there's also uh, a, another kind of theology called worldviewish theology. That's what he, the label he gave. And it's where theologians respond to questions posed to them by people living out the patterns of discipleship beyond the world of the church, you know. How do I relate to my Muslim neighbors? How do I raise my kids in a highly sexualized uh, society? Uh, what about the whole question of teaching evolution in the public schools? You know, those kinds of questions that require also a rigor, a deep kind of a scholarship. And Arthur Holmes was complaining that in the evangelical churches, we haven't done the kind of worldviewish theology. And that's because seminaries were not equipping pastors to struggle with the questions that are posed to them by the laity. And this, I think, is one of the great defects. Uh, I was telling some folks about uh, the late and of blessed memory, Robert Gulick, who taught New Testament at Fuller. And uh, he taught the Pauline epistles. 
And he told me once that when he first started teaching as an academically trained guild New Testament theologian, he thought the most important question that anybody could ask and any student could study about the epistle to the Galatians was the dating of Galatians. When was it written? He said, after spending several years teaching psychology students who had to take a New Testament course as a part of their PhD work in clinical psychology, he decided that dating among the Galatians was a far more important issue. You know, well, that's the, the world Jewish question as you get to those later chapters in, in Galatians, uh, thinking about sexual sins and, and lust of the flesh and, and the gifts of the spirit and the fruits of the spirit uh, kinds of things. Uh, and, and, and so we, we need uh, not to abandon the guilds, but in our curriculum, and, and this is one of the, as we all know, whenever we start talking about introducing new courses in new areas, uh, we always get into turf battles because what it comes down to is, are we gonna give up a course in our department? And these are important questions. Uh, and we have to understand the urgency for some people of these kinds of questions. But we, we, need, to, we need to find ways in theological education of expanding the turf, you know, of redefining the turf uh, so that we, we understand the scope of what we're doing in different ways and the agenda for what we are doing. And if we're gonna do that, friends, we've gotta come up with new reward systems um, in theological education. You know? uh, because the standards for get, getting tenure and for rank advancement are dictated basically by the guild. It's book reviews, scholarly essays, books with footnotes, and uh, the, the person who decides to work with psychologists on dating among the Galatians, uh, it's not clear that you're going to get the same kind. I was on the, the visiting uh, team for five years at, uh, at Harvard Divinity School. And uh, it was an extreme situation there because they had a wonderful person in spiritual formation. And she published a lot in a journal called Weavings. Many of you know that. And, uh, but she, when she was up for tenure, and uh, I ended up being interviewed by the head of the tenure committee, who was a secular feminist in the English department at, uh, at, at, at Harvard, uh, saying, I mean, there are no footnotes in what she's written. You know, what kind of magazine is this? That, and, and, and it's just a different set, and yet she was writing wonderful things about the patterns of spiritual formation and issues of gender and the like. And we need to be thinking about how we reward faculty when it comes to those basic questions because we will revert to the criteria established by the guilds unless we're willing to take on this issue and have honest and open and humble <laughs> discussions of, about these things. And then thirdly, there's a kind of theological problem. There are a lot of theological problems, but one of them that I think is especially endemic to the evangelical world is, um, an issue that was raised by the uh, Archbishop, uh, the former Archbishop of Baltimore, Rembert Weakland, in a piece that he wrote in Commonwealth, uh, Commonweal back in the 80s. He said, you know, Catholicism from the beginning of the 20th century has basically had a theology and spirituality of survival on the margins of the culture. Irish Catholics, Italian Catholics, Polish Catholics. Uh, how do we survive as minority immigrant groups on the margins of culture. He said the problem today, though, is that those, the children and grandchildren of those people who were formed by a theology and spirituality of survival on the margins of culture are in the president's cabinet. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're leaders in the business world. And we haven't had a theology, and Vatican II did a lot for us, but we too have had for most of the 20th century a theology and spirituality of cultural survival on the margins of the culture. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. You know? uh, getting ready for heaven and surviving in the meantime in a world that's going to get worse and worse with wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places and signs of the Antichrist all over the place. 
The amazing shift was in 1980 with the formation for people who had been formed by a spirituality and a theology of survival on the margins of culture. Suddenly in 1980, we declared ourselves to be the moral majority. But we never really thought that through adequately theologically. And we have a lot of work to do about how we equip God's people uh, to take responsibility for cultural renewal, for affirming and working toward good goals in the larger culture in which we find ourselves. And so we need honest and humble discussion and efforts uh, to do some new things in theological education. And uh, I'm going to mention, and th this sounds forbidding, but I've got seven points that I want to make, but I'm going to make them rather quickly. And the one is to, to, to recognize that uh, we do have some strengths. You know, when I was involved in this mainline Protestant, uh, Roman Catholic kind of discussion of uh, vocation in various areas of, of life, it, it struck me that in the evangelical world, we had a marvelous array of vocationally identified groups, you know? full gospel business people. Christian Medical Society, Christian Legal Society, Christians in the Visual Arts, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. These are our parachurch groups that have gathered uh, in, 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 in one strand of the parachurch movement. It's been around vocational groups outside of the church. And the problem is our churches, our local congregations have often found that kind of threatening, you know? Oh, you're involved in a Christian medical society, but why don't you do something for, for the kingdom you know, or for the church? We've been threatened by them, and yet we have so much to learn. I, I learned so much. Fellowship of Christian Athletes is a wonderful organization. And, and you know, Tom Skinner, the great uh, African-American evangelist, was the chaplain for the Washington Redskins for a while. And he had profound things to say about the systems of professional sports and what it's like to be bought and sold. <laughs> Uh, if you, if you, if you're, you, you know, the Redskins sell you to the, to the, to the Giants. I mean, th these are, are profound issues. They, they'll sell you, even though you have kids in high school, and and they don't even think about family issues and the like. You know, and Tom, you say it's almost a new form of slavery. You know, where you're being sold away. It's not family friendly and the like. I mean, those kinds of issues that we need to be wrestling with have been raised outside of the church in the parachurch organizations, although a lot of them haven't done much at all. I sat next to, on a plane to a guy, uh, next to a guy who was, uh, uh, got going about felt the full gospel uh, business, and he had just come back from a convention, and I said, what'd you talk about? He said, oh, it's just wonderful, really relevant, Israel and Bible prophecy. This guy sold insurance. Yeah. Uh, no discussion of redlining in the cities. Yeah. No discussions of, uh, of rich and poor in the, in the world of, of insurance policies and the like. Uh, so we need to recognize, though, that this is starting. You know, incidentally, I mentioned those groups. But there's also, a, if you get on a plane tomorrow, uh, there's a group called the Fellowship of Christian Airline Personnel who get together and pray for each other on challenges of what it's like to serve drinks in first class on, on airplanes, what it means to be pilots, what it means to work at the, at the gate desks and the like. Uh, this is a real blessing from the Lord that you don't find it in mainline Protestantism, you don't find it really in Roman Catholicism, uh, but we have it. And these are structures that we can make a, a tremendous use of. and and. I would say this, I, I won't ask for, for hands, but when's the last time you ever had anybody from the Fellowship of Christian Athletes come and talk to your faculty about what, what it means to be an athlete who's paid for athletic activity, you know? Or, or the Christian Medical Society or Christian Legal Society. These are very important conversations that we need to be having. Secondly, we need to make the case for our agenda in theological education, and we need to do that in humility and with, a, with deep understanding of the challenges. Because as a son of a preacher, I know my father basically saw his work in the ministry as preaching sermons and visiting the sick and the shut-ins. Yeah. 
He knew nothing about singles ministry. He knew nothing about youth ministry. He knew nothing about team ministries. He didn't know, know anything about the budget of the church and managing employees. And, and, and you have to learn all of this stuff today. And, and in addition, there are all the new things. You know, well, have you preached anything that raises the issue of immigration or issues of, of the character of the president or, or any of these kinds of things? And uh, you, you, we could easily feel in theological education, they keep telling us there's more and more stuff that we need to tell ministers that they have to be able to do and that they have to be able to think about. And, and we don't want to just be one more nagging group that's asking, well, take our issue seriously also. And that's why I think the third thing is that we need to think about the transcurricular character of what we're doing. Ran into this a couple years ago when we started thinking in, in theological education about new programs in creation care. I mean, the, 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 the worst thing in the world would be to make creation care one of the optional courses in ethics. Creation care ought to come up in Old Testament studies, New Testament studies, the history of the church, systematic theology. It ought to be under the categories of uh, what we're already teaching. And we need to stimulate those kinds of conversations because we don't want a theology of work to be one more ethics course that's optional for students, but we want it to somehow be integral. What, what's the history of the church dealing with the, the, the vocations of, of their members beyond the monastery, beyond the convent and the like. These are very important questions. So we need to think about the transcurricular aspect of what we're doing. Number four, um, that we, not, we shouldn't just teach the laity, but we need to learn from the laity. I was, I was visiting Max, Max Dupree, now also of blessed memory one time, and we had lunch together. And, and right at the end, he said, I got to go home and work on my speech. I'm speaking to a group of business people tonight. And I said, oh, good. what are you going to talk about? Oh, he said, I'm going to tell them that the topic they assignment is a, a very confused topic. They want me to talk about how to integrate their faith into work, their work. You know what I'm going to tell them? That's like asking the question, how you, how you integrate your marriage into your sex life? Yeah. <laughs> you get the point. Yeah. Um, we, we need to learn from the laity, and we need to have those conversations. I used to, Bob Lane, the CEO at John Deere, would, once a year I'd fly out and spend a day, and we'd talk theology. The theology of selling tractors to rural China was one of the most wonderful conversations that I've ever had, theologically. Uh, Mary Vermeer Andringa, just recently retired as CEO of Vermeer Manufacturing, the first woman to be appointed, the uh, woman, the head of the National Association of Manufacturers, very solid theological thinker. Uh, she should be teaching us about what it means to be working with road, you know, vehicles that deal with uh, roads and tunnels and farm machinery and all the rest. Uh, number five, it, it has to become a part of our worship focus. Just a quick example. I talked to a hedge fund manager a while back, and he said, you know, I love my church. I'm on the board of a seminary. I love my seminary. He said, but these people, have the faint, they don't have the faintest idea of what I do. He said, it would be really nice to know that the church and the seminary cared about my work as a hedge fund manager. And I said to him, what do you want? What would satisfy you? He said, what I don't want is lectures on economics from preachers or theology professors. You know what I want? I want the preacher someday to say, you know, let's pray for people in the financial world who are facing very difficult decisions. In fact, Joe told me that he's got a big thing coming up in the economy of Cambodia as a hedge fund manager next Thursday. Let's pray for Joe that God will give him wisdom. He said, I just like them to know that there's something that I'm involved in that I need prayer and the support of God's people for. And we need to find ways. Uh, two of my former PhD students, uh, Matthew Kamick and Corey Wilson, just finished a book on uh, liturgic, liturgies for uh, work. 
And uh, I think that that kind of work uh, needs to be done. Uh, number six, to discern how work by non-Christians also pleases God. Let me give you two wonderful quotations. I'm, I'm almost done. But uh, one is from uh, Leslie Newbigin, uh, who really said a lot about how our work ma matters to God. This is Leslie Newbigin. We, we can commit ourselves without reserve to all of the secular work that our shared humanity requires of us knowing that nothing that we do in itself is good enough to form part of the heavenly city's building, knowing that everything from our most secret prayers to our most public political acts is a part of that sin-stained human nature that must go down into the valley of death and judgment, and yet knowing that as we offer that work up to the Father in the name of Christ and in the power of the Spirit, it is safe with him and purged in fire, it will find its place in the holy city at the end. Yeah, that's great. But that's focusing on our work, the, the work of our people in our churches. But now here's Lou Meads, my old buddy, the late Lou Meads, who uh, started off his uh, college studies at Moody Bible Institute. And I, I love Moody, and, and, but Lou wasn't happy there. Uh, part, part of it was some lifestyle issues, but he, uh, he's, he transferred to Calvin College to get a liberal arts education. And in a book he wrote just before he died called My God and I, wonderful spiritual biography, he talked about the first English class he took at Calvin College. And here he says, he said, I was introduced that day to a God the likes of whom I had never even heard about, a God who liked elegant sentences and was offended by dangling modifiers. <laughs> Once you believe this, where can you stop? If the maker of the universe admired words well put together, and if he loved sound thinking, how he must also love a Bach concerto. And if he loved a Bach concerto, think of how he prized any human effort to bring a foretaste, be it ever so small, of the kingdom of justice and peace and happiness to the victimized people of the world. In short, Lou said, I met the maker of the universe who loved the world that he made and was dedicated to its redemption. I found the joy of the Lord not at a prayer meeting, but in English composition 101. Yeah. Now he's talking there about God likes good poems. God likes good newspaper columns. God likes ancient Chinese pottery formed 2,000 years before Jesus came into the world. God delights in a Muslim mother's love of her children and her fears that they're being bullied in the schoolyard. You know? God cares about these things. And God takes delight. And we need to think theologically not only about God's people doing God's will in the world, but also discerning the ways in which God, the cause of God, is, is furthered and promoted by people who do not name the name of Jesus Christ. And then we need, as Francis Schaeffer was fond of saying, we need to form co-belligerencies with them. We need to find partners with them. And whether it's writing good poetry or working for justice or working to produce fact, uh, tractors uh, for rural China or uh, writing insurance policies, uh, we need to find those kinds of things. And then finally, and, and this is closely related, we need to think in theological education about how we can foster interfaith dialogue about work. I was at Brigham Young University a couple weeks ago. I gave some lectures there, and I met with uh, some of the leaders in Salt Lake City while I was there of the uh, LDS Church. And one newly appointed high-level uh, person to a high-level office in the LDS said to me, Is there, he said, you know, I came to this job. They called me to this job in the church from uh, a, a position of CEO in an oil company. And he said, I came across evangelicals who just had wonderful thoughts about 
Christians in the oil business. He said, is there some way that we could just get together and talk about what it means to serve God in the oil business? Yeah. Uh, we had a, I, I, I had, this is no longer going, but for 10 years I had a pastor rabbi program at Fuller Seminary. And uh, we, we didn't, it was only t the 10th year that we, we talked about Jesus. But we started off with things like we, we got together two screenwriters from Hollywood. One of them was an Orthodox Jew who wrote the scripts for The New Adventures of the Old Christine, which was a very popular situation comedy, in dialogue with an evangelical who wrote the scripts for Home Improvement, which was also a major. And they, they, they talked together about how, as people of faith, they dealt with issues of sexual humor. They dealt with issues about honestly, honesty, about loving one's neighbor in scripts for, for, for situation comedies. It was one of the most exciting discussions that we had. And there were issues of faith. There were issues of, of the deep yearnings of the human spirit that emerged in those kinds of discussions. And if we had just walked in to meet rabbis and just say, what do you think about Jesus? Uh, that that would, would have shut down the conversation. Uh, but these are ways in which they're, they're not just extracurricular things, they're not just marginal things, but they're things about the deep issues of, of the human spirit. And uh, we need to think about how we can draw people, including with Muslim friends and Hindu friends, how we can draw people into discussions about how our work matters to us as people of faith, because there are marvelous conversations that emerge out of all of that. Well, let me just, just say this in conclusion. Uh, all of that. But one of the things that I have just loved about listening over this last day and a half is, is the expression of a Christ-centered approach to all of these things. You know? And I want to say, you know, Christine Rico said this this afternoon, a wonderful testimony, uh, that we should never forget the fact that we come to these discussions as people who are sinners who desperately need a savior. And I want to say, as we approach these things, they've been approached by other theologically oriented groups in the past, but I think we have a wonderful opportunity as evangelical Christians yeah, to ground this vision of work in a deep personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, in a deep sense that only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse us as individuals from all unrighteousness. You know, my, my, my spiritual pilgrimage, and I'll end with my testimony, you know, I was raised in a Christian home where from an early age, I was taught that the most important thing that anybody could ever experience in the universe was the loving embrace of a savior who went to Calvary on my behalf. I thank God for that. I got to college and I started thinking about the lordship of that same Jesus over the area of thought and that sustained me through my, my graduate studies on secular university campuses. And in the radical 60s, I began to think as a person who was very much involved in the anti-war movement, civil rights demonstrations and the like, I began thinking of the kingship of Jesus Christ. And I've been helped in all of this by that one. If you don't like anything else about Dutch Calvinism, just Abraham Kuyper's wonderful declaration that there is not one square inch of the entire creation out of which, about which Jesus Christ does not cry out, this is mine. This belongs to me. Yeah. Jesus is the Lord over the insurance business. He's the king over Wall Street. He's the king over Hollywood. And he looks down and he says, these two have, have these, these systems have wandered away from me and, and I've come into the world. So John 3.16, powerful. Yeah. That whosoever, whatever individual believes in him should not perish but to have everlasting life. But then that 17, yeah? and God sent the Son into the world, the cosmos, the created order, not to, not to condemn the created order, 
but that that whole created order, including the works of our cultural activities within the creation, will be redeemed and saved through him. In a little while, we're going to sing Jesus saves. I hope we never stop singing that. But there is also that line, earth shall keep her jubilee. God sent the sun into the cosmos, not to condemn the cosmos, but that the cosmos, including Hollywood and Wall Street and the insurance business and Pyongyang, North Korea, and the, the whole thing, uh, would not ultimately be condemned, but would be saved through him. But that has to be grounded in the love of a savior to whose cross we flee as sinners who desperately need to know that the blood of Jesus Christ and that blood alone can cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you all for a marvelous time and God bless you all. God does love the world and God loves us for the ways in which we are working in the world. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.